The first two chapters, chapter uh, 53 and chapters 54, um, were very much about what God was doing. They were descriptive. And so in chapter 53, it described the humble servant, which we know to be Jesus, which we know to be the Messiah. And it even spoke past tense about what he would do. 700 years before he came, it spoke past tense about what he would do to basically cover the transgressions uh, of those he loved, of spiritual Israel, not simply Israel um, by geopolitical boundaries or race, but Israel um, based on those who have circumcised hearts, who came to faith in, in the God Yahweh through his son, Jesus Christ. And so it was all about what God was going to do. It, we, we often say that Jesus was the lamb slain before time. It was God's plan from the beginning uh, to redeem fallen man through his son, Jesus Christ. And so 53 was just almost entirely, if not entirely, about what God would do through his son. Chapter 54 was what would happen in the wake of that, the promises that would be fulfilled through this new life that his son, the humble servant, would bring. And we chronicled those last, uh, last week or the last time we were in this series together, and, and they were wonderful. And just to unearth them, and, I mean, we barely really scratched the surface. I hope some of you went back and studied that uh, passage um, in more detail, but we just scratched the surface and we chronicled and we went through and, and, and in some cases we knew exactly what God was saying. In some cases it was more, you know, we had to use our imagination. It's as if he was saying this. And so the first two chapters were written past tense as in God is going to do this and it is most certainly going to happen. And if we were asked to do anything as the church, as spiritual Israel, it was just to enlarge our vision, to enlarge our, our, our tent stakes, to imagine that this movement and this blessing was exceedingly and abundantly above all we can imagine or think possible. It wasn't simply a reestablishment of uh, Israel in, in political boundaries um, as a worldly kingdom. It was going to be a worldwide movement. And, and we were able to kind of take um, the promises of God in, in, in chapter 54 and overlay them in one of some of the things that Jesus said to us um, in the New Testament scriptures and even overlay them with what John prophesied in Revelation and see that this is absolutely, um, through Jesus Christ, we are absolutely being given um, the fulfillment of these promises. But again, very descriptive, very certain. Um, and, and, and as I like to say, what I think... God is doing, especially for us, and beginning in those two chapters, before we get into today's chapter and the ones that follow, it's as if he's front-loading the grace. You know, um, we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man shall boast. As I often say, though, faith without works or faith without action is dead. It most certainly leads to works eventually, but the grace is front loaded. Many times we recognize that the grace exists there. It's like it's in a cloud floating over our heads and we're trying to download it. We're trying to access it and it is faith that allows us to access that grace. But in these two chapters, we just have God making promises, describing his means of salvation and beginning to describe what that would look like in, in those two chapters. And it's as if he's not just um, providing the grace that we will now access by faith, but by describing it, by putting it in, his, in a word, he's actually giving us the substance or the sustenance to lead to that faith. Uh, there's a scripture that I like to quote all the time. It says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The most literal translation of that would be uh, faith in Jesus Christ comes by hearing the gospel about Jesus Christ and the cross. But what we find when we're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that faith continues to come through that relationship with Jesus Christ based on every word that he speaks to us. And so the difference in going out and naming it and claiming it and doing what we want and having self-centered motives and walking by faith, which can be, you know, kind of abstract and hard to discern sometimes, is did I hear this? Did God lead me in this? Has it been tested? Has it been refined? Did this, come, did this word come to me by making my, my life and my heart a living sacrifice and then God just placed it upon me? And, and, and then when that word comes upon me and I hold on to it and I'm, I'm acting out of that faith, then I have the real thing. So two chapters, basically asking us to do nothing but believe, telling us everything about what God is going to do, incredibly descriptive. Today we move into chapter 55, and we're starting to get, um, we're getting prepared 
for where the rubber is going to meet the road. How these promises, how this salvation that is existing in this cloud, so to speak, is actually going to get translated to us. How is this going to work? How is this going to be actualized? How is this actually going to happen? How am I going to realize the promises of God in my life personally, in my church, in my community, interpersonally? How is Isaiah 53 and 54, written almost 3,000 years ago, going, going to come alive for me and my family? I've heard it. I believe it. I want it. Now, now what? And so we pick it up in chapter 55, and we've moved into a, uh, into a section now that is less descriptive. There's a lot of describing still going on, and is more prescriptive. Um, you might say that 53 and 54 were the call, and 55 gets us um, prepared to respond. And it shows us the nature of how this is going to come into our life. And the good news is, it's not by works, lest any man shall boast. It is by faith, and faith comes by hearing. And the entire chapter really is all about, if you don't hear anything else, hear this, it's about listening. It's about the power of listening to God. It's about the power of allowing God to speak into our lives and to reverse our current thought patterns. It's about the intentionality that we have to have as followers of Jesus Christ to seek his presence, to seek his word, to seek his spirit, to allow those things to breathe life into us in the form of words and allow those words to reign supreme. That's what it's all about. In 55 verse 1, it begins this way. It says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Now what we're about to find out is that he's actually not talking about literal like bread and water. Uh, if we take these first few verses and, and we kind of overlay them with what Jesus said in the Gospels, especially John, which we were recently in, um, they're, they're going to sound very similar. Remember Jesus said to the woman at the well, um, I have water to drink, and if you drink it, you'll never be thirsty again. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. If you eat this bread, you'll never hunger again. Now, you can take that very literally, though that would be very inaccurate. What he's talking about is a spiritual feeding, um, a, a, a hunger, an insatiable desire that exists in the hearts of, of every man and every woman on earth. Some of us define it well because we've been in the scriptures and under the counsel of the Spirit long enough that we can properly define that insatiable hunger that exists inside of us is not for anything in this world, but for something beyond this world, for, for God. Um, as it says in Ecclesiastes, I think it's Ecclesiastes, it says that God has put eternity in the hearts of men. And that eternity is a desire for his glory, his eternal presence in the hearts of men. It's a hunger, it's a desire, and, and, and we're, we're eating food, and we're drinking wine, and we're doing all these things externally to try to feed this hole. It's, just, it's this mad drive that we have to feed ourselves, and yet we always wake up hungry, we always wake up empty. And so at a higher level, spiritually, um, God is saying through the prophet, as Jesus said in the New Testament, that if you come to me, I'm going to feed you something to take care of that insatiable desire. So it's, it's, it's quite a boast. Immediately he's saying for us to do something. He's saying, come. Uh, I drew near to you through the promises of the last two chapters. Now you draw near to me. A call, a response, a process that can be repeated over and over again. Come, all you who are thirsty. Come, you who are hungry. Eat and drink spiritually. Be feel, filled, be satisfied. Verse 2, it says, why spend money? On what is not bread, and labor on what does not satisfy. And some might say, well, I literally work for bread. Um, the metaphor bread, I work for cash so I can buy bread so I can feed my family. And he's saying, why do that? Why try to earn this? Why put all this external effort into something that I will give you so freely? Now remember, there was a cost. The reason we're not paying it is because the humble servant paid it two chapters earlier, right? Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe, that's the hymn we sing. 
So, th- so it's not that it's of no value, it's of great cost. It just costs more than we can pay. It costs the precious and perfect and holy blood of Jesus Christ. It's been paid, so now we are free by faith to come and to partake in it. So why try to earn it? Why run here and there to and fro to try to feed yourself with it when, when it doesn't even satisfy? And then, I love this, if we, if we combine this with, with verse 3, three times uh, he says this. I'm, one thing I've learned is anything that God says in the Bible is worth you know, repeating time and time and time again. Uh, I've heard it said that, that, that great leaders, great pastors, great preachers, we don't, we don't actually um, instruct as much as we remind, Right? And so uh, I remind you to listen to God, and it's as if, you know, in repeating these words, uh, he's saying this is important, this is really important, this is really, really important, because this is how salvation comes to earth as it is in heaven. It doesn't come by effort, it's not by might, nor by power, as they say in the Old Testament, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And, And how do we know when the Spirit is moving, what is the most powerful way that God moves in our life? It's actually not in these uh, demonstrations and manifestations all around us. More than anything, it's in intelligible words that instruct us and correct us and improve us and make promises to us. And so he says, listen. And he says, listen. Surprised he doesn't say it a third time. Listen, comma, listen to me. And eat what is good, and you will find delight in the richest affair. There, Jesus said in the New Testament, he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Another way of saying that, it might be, Blessed are those who humble and, uh, hunger and thirst for a right relationship with God. Another way of saying it might be, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a right relationship with God that, that leads to receiving words from God. Blessed are those who um, hunger and thirst for right relationship with God that leads to right words from God, that leads to right thinking from God, that reverses bad thinking and gives good thinking. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for that. I would say, um, to expand upon that just a little bit and to stay in line with it, blessed are we when we recognize that is what we are hungering and thirsting for. Blessed are the poor because, you know, they're going to inherit stuff. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are broken. Blessed are those who are uncomfortable. Blessed are those among us today who are so uncomfortable and so dissatisfied with their life that they're willing to radically enter the presence of God and listen. And I don't mean just listen, but listen with an intent to truly hear. Listen with a, with a willingness to let it d- deeply penetrate their heart and change the way they think and change the way they live. Blessed are us who are so frustrated and so broken and so aware of it that, that a radical reversal sounds like good news to us. And unblessed are us who are so comfortable so set in our ways, so stubborn, so self-assured that no matter what God says today, there is no way we're going to change what we do tomorrow. We're not going to change our thoughts, which leads to a change in our heart, which leads to a change in our words, which leads into a change in our actions. Because that threatens the status quo. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Unblessed are those who feel like they're well fed. This is all about uh, not someone who has money because that's paid for. This is all about good news for the poor. Uh, The gospel for the kingdom of God is good news for the poor. And I'm telling you, that isn't just the material poor. That's the spiritual poor. Um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are, who are the poor. This is good news for the poor because there might be the ones who are pliable enough to receive it. God does not prefer the poor. It just seems that sometimes when we're poor, we're in a better place to prefer God. In, th- in verse 3, more about listening. Listen. Remember Charles Stanley. If you ever watch Charles Stanley preach, I love Charles Stanley. He's always like, listen, now listen, now listen. And it's like, it gets you to the edge of your chair. It's awesome. That's what this guy's doing. In verse 3, he says, give ear and come to me. Listen again, that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. 
Uh, To overly simplify what they're saying here, David was promised that someone would always sit on his throne. If we read the language, um, it seems to allude to the fact that at some point, the king of Israel would be none other than the king who is the Messiah himself. And and Jesus, indeed, indirectly through Jesse and through David and through his father Joseph, seemed to come, you know, at some level, humanly through the line of David. But the biggest promise was to David that Israel would be ultimately exalted and the king that sat on his throne would be the king of kings and the Lord of lords and the Messiah of the whole world. And so uh, it's as if what he's saying is that, that this covenant that is to come is actually just a covenant to complete the covenant that began with David, the very love promised to David. And so when we read the Old Testament versus the New Testament, and we think in terms of the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant, and there's a lot of debate among faithful people about this, um, I actually believe there's one covenant, Old Testament and New, that is completed through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so he's saying here, listen, so that you can inherit the covenant. This is a big covenant. This isn't a little covenant. This isn't a temporary covenant. This is an everlasting covenant that began with David and will end never. Everlasting. That word everlasting is important to us because everlasting means forever and like we're way down the line. It's very difficult for us to come into these passages and say this is for us if, if this kind of language does not exist here. Absolutely everlasting. This includes all that would come and believe in the Messiah to sit on David's throne, the humble servant in chapter 53, which we continue to celebrate and to worship through the Gospels and all the ways that God communicates with us now. In verse 4, he says, See, I have made him a witness. He's talking about Christ, the Messiah. Uh, We can also assume that he means the body of Christ, us. We've made him, his people, a witness to the people, a ruler and commander of the people. He says, surely you, I love the way the language twists here a little bit, and he begins to speak to the people and not necessarily about the Messiah, about the one that would sit on David's throne. Instead of speaking about him, he's speaking about us as if he's speaking about him. It's really cool stuff. Surely you will summon nations you do not know, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, For he has endowed you with splendor. He has endowed you with the Holy Spirit. He's endowed you with his word. This is uh, almost a a prelude to Acts in the day of Pentecost and the way the church would be anointed. I feel like you could take this particular passage, verse 4 and 5, and and you can see it um, already beginning to be revealed in the chapter before when he says to enlarge your tent stakes that you're going to go into nations. But you could also take verses uh, 4 and 5, and you could lay it right over the top of Matthew 28, like 16 through 20, 18 through 20 for sure, which is the Great Commission, a command to go to all nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything he commands us. And, and, and so this is like, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like a king summoning. It's a king calling. It's a, it's a king developing his kingdom. It's, it's a powerful king who stands there as a powerful witness to the world. And he calls and he brings in the nations and he makes them his disciples. He makes them his subjects and he blesses them. And they have a servant, uh, a servant um, leader relationship, a Lord servant type relationship. And even more intimate than that. And, and, and the language kind of twists here, and he's, and he's beginning to say, um, the calling that will be upon this witness, upon this Messiah, will be upon you as well, as his people. Now remember, we're, we're getting this in, in context of this covenant. We're getting ready to not only hear from God, but to get busy about doing what he tells us to do. Uh, the promise of 53 and 54 actualized through the power of the Holy Spirit, through God bringing his words, and then lived out, that faith lived out through obedience of what not only happens in the chapters ahead, but in every word he speaks to you because you now, being the blood-bought, spirit-filled people of God, have this opportunity to not only have a relationship with him through the community of Christ, the church, but personally um, as, as, as to your Savior and to your Lord. And so this overlays boldly, it gives us a sense of the nature of what comes next. Um, we, we command. Uh, we don't suggest. We speak boldly. 
I was reading uh, the other day, and it was in one of our readings. I hope you guys all read it. But the disciples were out, and they were getting the early church started, and a couple of them got arrested, and they got thrown in jail. And they spoke up powerfully and eloquently. They seemed to have this uh, stout heart and this stature that they didn't have before. And they spoke boldly and they were released from prison. And they were so excited because God was doing miracles. He was making them powerful. They were commanding nations and they were confounding people. And they were so excited. And I love the way they prayed. They prayed. They didn't pray that God would deliver them from trouble. He didn't pray that, that God would make their life easier. Their prayer was that this power, this anointing, uh, this witness that he had placed upon them that is prophesied in Isaiah 55, 4 and 5, they prayed that they would just speak the word boldly and clearly. Don't change anything. We love the drama. We love the conflict. It gives us an audience with people we wouldn't normally have an audience with. And we stand there and we, we quote the, their Old Testament scriptures, which is dead literature to them. them. We, we, we preach them with life and power and, and first-person authority. We have this anointing. We have this clarity. We're unschooled, uneducated, unordinary peop, uh, ordinary people. And we confound the wise. And we love it. And so don't change anything around us. Continue to inspire us from the inside and let us be this bold witness that is prophesied in Isaiah 55 because we're loving it. It's like the best thing that ever happened to us. Now the old us, prior to the anointing, prior to the infilling, uh, what we really wanted you to do was help us catch a lot of fish and be rich. But the new us, we have found a blessing that exceeds that. We found a blessing that exceeds circumstances. It, it's a blessing from the inside out. It's the anointing. It is, it is the strength of God poured on the inside. It is the clothing of God uh, all, all upon us on the outside. It is this ability to be your bold witness. And what I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that the promise made uh, in Isaiah and the promise received in the Gospels and in the book of Acts uh, is still a promise for us right here, right now, today. And God wants to give it to you, too. And that's the covenant. And you hear me say all the time, he could bless you externally over and over again. And I believe that he does, and I believe that he will. But those are, those are circumstantial. They're temporary. The blessing and the covenant we're after with God today is, not, is one that begins now and ends never and gives us strength regardless of anything that happens on the outside. In verse 6, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Again, seek, come, listen. Don't really do anything yet. Draw in, lean in. In the context of this you know, whole series that we're in right now, like just get yourself ready to listen. Prepare yourself to not only hear, but to be pliable enough to receive and to respond from God. Have a sense of urgency. Uh, I read in between the lines here, and I, I think... It's as if what God is saying is this is so, this is so powerful and this is so life-changing like that you need to go for it. If you've tapped into the hunger that he is you know, drawing upon in the first verses, and if you're excited about the power that is being promised in maybe the second set of verses in this passage, then the next obvious response would be to seek and to seek with urgency. To recognize that we exist in a time and space that is very limited. We have, like, we have a limited amount of time between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're in this period of God's favor where his grace is abundant, his mercy is powerful. And he is beginning to teach us to hear and to respond, to seek him who has sought us. And he's saying, not only is that era relatively short in the history of the world, your era, your little segment of life within that era is even shorter. I mean, count the days. Number my days aright, Lord, so that I may gain a heart of wisdom. Give me that kind of understanding. When, when Elaine and I first moved to California, um, we had never seen um, the kind of raccoons they have in California. They're na they are nasty. They kill people there. I mean, they have felony records in California. I'm not even kidding. They kill dogs for sure. 
And they're just nasty, nasty critters. And when they, when they sent, they're, and they're hungry, they're, they have this insatiable hunger. And when they sense that there's, I'm telling you, the damage they can do when they sense that there is food, it, it's unfathomable. It is disproportionate. They look so cute, but they're nasty little critters. They're rodents. And so we bought this, um, we bought this thing for our dog food to put it on the outside of our house. And it was, I mean, it was, it was seriously secure stuff, you know? And, and the damage they did to our back porch to get to that food, it looked like somebody had come through with like a Sherman tank. I mean, just tearing it and ripping it and seeking it and hungering. For, I mean, they, they had to have it. Now, I know, that's, I know this is kind of a ridiculous and elementary illustration, but it's one that I think we ought to have today in the midst of being religious. Like, that is the kind of hunger and reckless abandon I think we need when we seek the Word of God. When you go home and you're sad... When you go home and your marriage is in trouble, when you go home and you don't have enough money, when you just heard from the doctor you're sick, when you've just been betrayed, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're jealous, when you're sinning, when you're being tempted, when all these malfunctions are going on all around you, and you're, and you're feeling the emptiness inside, what you're really feel, feeling at the most core level is not, is not a consequence. Listen to this. It is not a consequence of your circumstances. Do you understand? All of these outside pressures are identifying the fact that there ain't enough on the inside to handle it. Because I bet you, I know that I'm not doing this, I bet you with all the money I have in my wallet, which is like eight bucks that I need, I bet you money, you are not praying like the disciples prayed, which is don't change my circumstances. Make me bold and make me strong and make me a witness in this situation. I bet bet you're not. I bet you don't see the opportunity for that. I bet you're praying for God to put a band-aid on the outside and, and allow this to happen again day after day, week after week, again and again and again. And God is coming to you today and he is offering a solution on a whole nother level, another level altogether. He's saying you're, you're laboring for relationships that won't last. You're laboring for food that you're going to eat and be hungry again in a day. You're laboring for a dream and retirement. You're laboring for a vacation. You're laboring for a perfect romance. You're laboring for perfect health. You're laboring for all these temporal things that will not last. And I have it for you, something that will feed you insatiably. And good news, it's not, you don't have to be a Buddhist I, offended, I, every, I offend every group in here eventually. I'm offending Buddhists today. You don't have to have some mystical, weird sense about how to come into the presence of God and to feed on his spirit. All you got to do is open up your Bible, go to church, get around the people of God, and listen. Because as these words come in, all of this is going to fling off. And I'm telling you, you got to listen with an open heart. you got to listen with an open mind. And you got to seek God while he is near. He's near. He's here. We can almost re, um, reinterpret our circumstances to be a, a calling from God to come to him. When we're in the midst of this incredible turmoil, we could be like the raccoon. I am hungry, and at least this time I know what to, to seek. Uh, I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to rip this house apart, not looking for the dog food that the raccoon was trying to get at Brian's house, looking for the word of God. I'm going to open up this Bible, and I'm not going to get up from this chair until God leads me to a passage, and God leads me to a section where he feeds my soul with his word and with his spirit, with the strength to get up from this place, and not only to survive, but to thrive for him. And this is what is offered in this covenant that God brings us today. Remember, fall back on 53. What Jesus paid for, he paid for. It is done. Go back to 54. There was nothing status quo or mediocre about the promises of chapter 54. Come into chapter 55, and he's saying, I gave you all that information so that when I said listen, you would listen. Listen. Oh, my gosh, that we would listen. Let the wicked forsake their ways. That's us, by the way. That's us with our pre-regenerate minds. We're wicked. That is us even after we are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit when we're living more according to the flesh than the Spirit is within us. 
Uh, this is a, you could say that the spirit is always willing and the flesh is often weak. And when we've been living according to the flesh, then the spirit that exists inside of us and this eternal glory that we have, this powerful witness and all the promises that we have from God has gone dormant. It has been grieved. It has gone minuscule. And for the moment, though we are eternally righteous through our relationship with God, we are in the wicked category because our thoughts, which leads to our words, which leads to our actions, are evil. Any given moment. Caught myself just the other day in that pattern again. And so he says here, this is, this is the nature, this is the violent nature of the coming together of an unholy people with a holy God receiving grace. It is, a, it is violent, though. It is the wicked meeting the holy. He said, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon There's a place in the Old Testament that I like to quote. It says that we need to be able to take every thought captive. Like As we think it, we need to consider it. We need to contain it. Uh, Especially in maybe terms of relationships, in terms of any time it comes loaded with fear, anger, a sense of betrayal, jealousy, especially when it comes with things, the fruit of which are not the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, When there's no love, and there's no hope, and there's no um, optimism, and there's no strength, and there's no confidence attached to that thought, that's a good indication that it is not the right thought. And I'm not like Mr. Prosperity Guy. I don't mean that. What I mean is when we have these thoughts, we need to take them captive. We need to say, this is coming out of my flesh. This is not coming out of the Spirit. This is legitimate in the sense that I'm really thinking it. This is how I really feel. This is emoting out of my uh, soul, which is not necessarily controlled by the Spirit right now, but controlled by my emotions and how I feel. And I'm emoting this thought, and if I'm not careful, if I don't take it captive, it's going to lead to some really bad stuff. Uh, I like to think of it this way. It's like we fill up our mind with whatever our mind is filled up with, and that fills up our heart. And from the overflow of our heart, not only does our mouth speak, our hands act. Our words are like missiles. They're self-fulfilling prophecies. And we are so wired into our instincts and our guts and our opinions that we sometimes have a very difficult time reversing them. And so that is exactly the nature of what he's saying. Let the wicked forsake their ways. This is how this salvation will come. It's going to come through a reversal of ways and thoughts. From going from unrighteous to righteous. And so he's saying to us, prepare to turn, prepare to live a different way, prepare for everything to be reversed. And the good news is the price for that has been paid. He will freely pardon, not freely in the sense that there was no price paid, freely in the sense that we can't pay the price. The price has already been paid for us. And then he goes on to say uh, one of my favorite uh, passages in Scripture. I say that all the time, but I mean it every time. For my thoughts, God's thoughts, Isaiah speaking on behalf of God here, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And those things are linked, right? What we think is what we say is what we do. Now right now it's all about listening and being programmed with the right information. The doing is going to come later, but he's preparing us to listen and he's preparing us to take with utmost importance what we think and what we hear and what we believe. So your thoughts are not my thoughts. Therefore, you might say, your ways are not my ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are than the earth, so are my way, my, my ways higher than your ways, God is saying, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And, and, and I'm telling you, that's got to be humbling to any of us. Your ways and your thoughts, God's ways and God's thoughts, not the same. Now look, I've been doing this a while, and I can tell you for a fact, and I don't mean to offend anyone today. I mean to offend everyone today a little bit. And there's sarcasm there. Don't take that too seriously. But the older we become as human beings, the more difficult we become to pastor. I don't care whether you're a Christian or not. Listen to what I'm telling you. The older we become as human beings, the more difficult we become to pastor. The older I become as a man, the more difficult it becomes for me to change. Because we've been living in this world a long time. We've been around the block a lot of times. We know how the world thinks. We know how the world 
acts. We have seen, and through very cynical eyes, the way that it is. We have guts that tell us one thing. We have instincts hardwired into our emotions. We have thoughts. They are almost automatic. And by the way, they're not always wrong in a worldly sense, right? So we're loaded up with, we're jaded, and we're cynical, and, and, and we're really good at doing natural observation, not supernatural op- observation, but natural observation, and, and we, have, we have a sense of perspective and a level of understanding about, that, about this level compared to the infinite level of God, and we're not utterly, utterly wrong. And you talk, I mean, I'm telling you, you talk to any 50-year-old man and he will exalt his gut over God any day of the week. And and he has all kinds of self-fulfilling prophecies to go with when he trusted his gut to continue to believe in it. I stand there and I'm telling, I stand there with people and I do the same thing. I am equally guilty. I am equally guilty and equally cynical and God is busting my chops and I hope he's busting yours too. But I stand there with people, and I stand there myself, and our gut, it tells us something. It tells me that this is the way it's going to go. My gut tells me, when I was talking to that person, this is what they think. My gut tells me, based on their personality, this is who they are. My gut tells me that if we do this, this is going to happen. I trust my gut. I had a businessman, a very successful businessman one time tell me when he was looking for a location to put his business that he would stand on that piece of ground. He said, my final analysis is to stand on that ground and to follow my gut, and it has never failed me. But you know what Scripture tells us to do? Scripture says to take those gut thoughts that seem right to men, but in the end lead to death, all those ideas, all those opinions that are so hard, hardwired in them, take them captive. You don't necessarily have to throw them out, but to take them captive and, and, and to bring them into the presence of God. And if they don't match up with what God is saying, to despise them. We take captive every thought, every idea, every opinion, all of our guttural instincts, anything that exalts itself above what? The knowledge of God, which is supreme. And this is incredibly harmful, especially in our assessment of relationships and our assessment of people, because we will follow our gut and our cynical attitudes, and we're only seeing from here, and we're not seeing what God is doing. And we do more damage to ourselves, more damage to our spouses, more damage to our kids, more damage to the people in our church, more damage to the people that we work with by sizing them up with our guts rather than seeing them through the eyes of God. And that's just one category. We do more damage to ourselves basing our current circumstances on our, our current analysis and what our gut and maybe even the gut of someone we trust is saying. We need to submit to the counsel of God. We need to allow him to rip the worldly scales off of our eyes and allow us to see what is absolutely true. We need not only to take these thoughts captive, but when they are in, in, incorrect, we need to reverse them. We need to change. And the older we get, the harder it is to do. Because we've learned to trust our guts and give a head fake towards worshiping God. It is absolutely insufficient to worship God in any other way, in any lesser way than what I'm saying here today. If you are not letting God in your thought life, then there is no point in coming to church, raising your hand, and singing a single song. Because he is really not Lord of your life. And that's just a fact, Jack. Verse 10, this is the good part. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. There seems to be a sense that coming into God's presence, receiving his word, uh, drinking it, being filled with it, consuming it, might even lead to some temporal blessings. Maybe that's what he's saying, but it certainly seems to be saying more than anything else. It's going to be powerful and effective for something. Just like the rain naturally comes from heaven to earth and brings blessings, it waters the earth, making it bud and flourish, making it it fruitful, multiply and increase, so that it yields seed for the sower, so that it will continue to multiply and increase 
and bread for the eater so that it, can, so that it provides food for my people. Just like I send the, a natural blessing through rain uh, from heaven, so to speak, so I send a supernatural blessing through my word, God would say. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word, we often say, never returns void, but you know what it does all the time? It lands on hard hearts and falls away. Jesus spoke about it. A farmer went out to sow seed. I go out to sow my word. I send forth this word, my thoughts, my, my attitudes, my, my, what you lead to actions, and, and all kinds of things. And Jesus said, I throw out these seeds all over the place, and it lands on all different types of hearts, and worldliness chokes it out in some cases. A hard heart allows it to be stolen in other cases, and in a very few cases it actually penetrates, it takes root, and it produces a harvest, many times that which was sown. And so, though my word is powerful, it is only powerful when we retain it. And so God is saying, uh, uh, come into my presence today. Understand that the words that I'm aiming in your direction, they're like smart bombs. They come with precision. Until we get um, Isaiah 55, why would God say anything else? Until we have a proper introduction to the power um, and the effectiveness and the supremacy of God's word, why would he speak another word? Whenever you go and watch like a prominent person speak, you notice that they never just trot the prominent person out on the platform and let them start speaking. First thing that happens is somebody that typically the, the, the audience is familiar with who has their own accolades comes up and he reads a short resume. He gives the guy's uh, resume. He says, uh, this guy has done this and he's been to this school and he's an expert in this and he was given a prize for that. And they, and they really exalt the guy in, in, in the minds of the audience. So one, he receives a warm um, welcome from the audience and the respect that he deserves in that sense. But so that no matter how good or bad his delivery is, the audience is leaning in and they're saying, this guy, he has something to listen to. This guy is worth listening to. And so you might say Isaiah 55, 53 and 54 really set it up, but 55 is the introduction, and it's saying what comes next is really worth listening to. You should lean into what comes next. These are not just idle words from an idle source. This is, this is worthy of your attention. And you shouldn't listen to these words the way you listen to all words. You should listen to these words with an open heart and an open mind. You should prepare yourself for what is going to happen next because it is going to be an absolute waste for us to read chapters uh, 56, 57, especially 58, and even 59 if you're not leaning in and if you don't think that this is God's word coming to you live and in person. Listen, listen, listen. Give ear. When it's not clear, seek. When it violates what your gut says and what you know to be true on an earthly level, get rid of that and gain this instead. This is the pearl of great price. If it costs you everything, if it costs you every thought and every way you live now in the world, if you have to get rid of that to receive this, then get rid of it because your words and your thoughts don't come with the power of God's. They do not come with the power and the promises of God which is that I will achieve every purpose for which I sent it. And when it lands on you, you know what that means? It, it, it means I have a heart now that I can speak to, and I can achieve in you from this day forward, through this lifestyle of listening and responding, I can achieve in you every single desire I have for you until the end. You will not miss your destiny from today until the end if you, if you take on this lifestyle of seeking God, which is also, by the way, a lifestyle of repentance. In verse 12, it says, You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you. Kind of like a sound of music or something, right? And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. I, I think the best way to read this, I don't, a, a lot of people might read this and say, this is God talking about, this is going to lead us to heaven one day when like, literally like, birds and trees are going to sing. Um, I, don't, I don't read it that way at all. I don't think this is uh, eschatological. I don't think this is about the end times. I think it is about um, earth before heaven. And I think we need to read this with, you know, um, a sense of imagery and metaphor. And so I would add, not to take away or add to Scripture because I don't want to do that, but it will be as if. 
The mountains and hills burst into song before you. It will be as if the trees of the field will clap their hands. Uh, instead of a thorn bush will grow a juniper. That's a metaphor. Instead of trouble and, and, and difficulty and sweat and toil, uh, you'll inherit beautiful things instead. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be uh, for the Lord's renown, an everlasting sign that will endure forever. As I was spending some time meditating on this the other day, it seems to me what these last two verses seem to be alluding to, and indeed maybe the whole passage, is God saying this. If you will submit yourself to me, if you will lean in and listen, if you will allow me to reestablish a right relationship with you through my word, which has supremacy in your heart, if you will um, submit yourself to this violent encounter of reversal and repentance, if you will take your gut and your instincts off the throne and replace it with mine instead, then, then what you will begin to see, at least on the inside, maybe not on the outside, is, is perhaps a reversal of the curse of Genesis. Uh, remember in Genesis where God said to Adam, um, gardening ain't going to be no fun anymore. Uh, you, will, you will earn what your family needs, the bread and the water you need for temporal existence. Forget eternal because that's off the table for the moment. For temporal existence, you will get it through hard work and through sweat. Uh, you're you're, you, you're going you're gonna to go from being in a place of creative ease uh, where work uh, d- had a whole different definition. Work was like art to a time when you were going to have to just, you're going to have to earn it, man. Hard work, hard labor. We, it's kind of like we received a sentence of hard labor. And women literally received a sentence of hard labor because isn't labor hard? I've seen it four times, not pretty, never want to do it again. And, 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 and so all the things that were supposed to happen beautifully and creatively and artistically and wonderfully and filled with joy, there's still some, some of that. There are relics of that, but a lot of it comes through toil and hard labor. And what I read in this is, you know what? Uh, your sin brought you into disharmony with the Creator. Therefore, your sin brought you into disharmony with creation. But if we reverse your relationship with the Creator, it is actually possible to reverse your relationship with creation. And that isn't name it and claim it, and that doesn't mean that like, literally like, a, a thorn bush in your yard will, will reappear as a juniper or azalea or whatever you think it's going to be, if wishing made it so, my yard is so filled with weeds. But it will be as if. Um, there'll be an ease to your work. There'll be an ease to what you do. As you reverse your thoughts, and that reverses your words, and that reverses your actions, as you reverse uh, what is the God of your life, which is no longer your, your flesh or your belly, and it is the spirit that lives inside of you, and God through his word himself, as you reverse uh, the disharmony you have with God, it will bring you into harmony with what he has created. Toil could come back to a place of creative ease. What did Jesus say? He said, take my yoke, uh, my burden is light, and my yoke is easy, right? And, and despite circumstances, there'll be an ease. I, I wonder sometimes how the ancient um, who had faith in God endured some of the things they endured. How did they persevere in such a hard wor- world? And, and, and I really think at, at the essence of it, it wasn't that they were ascetics or they were so strong on the outside. I think at the core of it, they were so endowed with the pleasure of God on the inside that it really wasn't that hard. Uh, it looked hard. And sometimes they had to work it out with fear and trembling to get their spirit in the right place. But I don't think it was hard. When Stephen the martyr died and he had the grace to die, like Jesus died, and he said, forgive them, they know not what they do. His heart was literally breaking for the people all around him. But his destiny, the thing that God wanted to achieve through him, which was a martyr's death to glorify him with, didn't, it wasn't as hard as you might think. Because I think he had broken into this place of ease. But not to get too far ahead of ourselves and to try to close quickly, uh, there is going to be a requirement. And it's going to be repentance. Repent and be baptized. Seal the moment. 
Prepare yourself for a lifestyle of reversal. Prepare yourself for a lifestyle of repentance. Prepare prepare yourself for a lifestyle uh, where your ego has to take a back seat. Prepare yourself and prepare myself for a lifestyle of humility. Prepare to take your vocation and, and see it and consecrate it and surrender it to God as a calling. Prepare to take your work and make it a mission. Prepare to change everything, at least your attitude towards everything, because everything is submitted to God. Recognize that this is not earning grace because grace has already been provided two chapters ago through Jesus Christ. Realize that the promises are certain, past tense done. Recognize that the ability to listen and to submit and to surrender yourself to God is a gift of the atonement through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's just simply something we simply receive. I believe with all my heart that we haven't seen anything yet in the life of this church in all of its different locations, and in the lives of the members of this body, we haven't seen anything yet. If we will give ourselves wholly to the will and to the word of God, I think that he will lift us up. I think the splendor that is promised in verse 5 will become our splendor. I don't think we've seen anything yet. I think in direct proportion to how much we are surrendered and submitted to God, He will fill us and he will glorify us with his Holy Spirit. I think people will look at us and they will be drawn to us, not necessarily because of the circumstances on the outside, but the ease and the strength that is clearly exuding from us on the inside. I really believe that to be true with all of my heart. I think what the world is looking for and they can't define it yet, we need to receive so that we can help them define it and we can tell them that it is absolutely true. You don't hunger for a new car You don't hunger for a new man. You don't hunger for better health or wealth, as wonderful as those things might be. What you hunger for is God. And what you need to drink is the water that Jesus promised, where he said it will never lead, that you'll never be thirsty again. What you really hunger for is the bread that Jesus said is himself, and if you receive it, you'll never hunger again. An internal ease, an internal strength, the wisdom and the guidance not only to be led by God, but to lead others. I think that is the promise of this covenant. And I think the purpose of the chapter today was to set up what comes next and to make sure that we're all really, really, really leaning in. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for a proper introduction to what comes next. Jesus, if any word landed on any heart today, and was understood, was perceived, and was received. I pray that you would plant it deeply into that heart, including my own. And I pray that you would watch over it and that you would nurture it and that it would come forth and it would produce a harvest of righteousness, of peace and joy beyond circumstances, of power, of wisdom, of clarity, our born-again birthright of clarity, dear God. I pray that it would produce that in each and every heart. Not only do I pray that this word would land on every single heart in this room and prepare us for what is next, I pray that it would land collectively on the heart of this church, that it would knit us to you and knit us to one another, that we would lean in with one ear together, that we would receive this and that we would begin to function as one person before you. Jesus, uh, we come into your presence today and we bow down And we we say this, uh, I want your thoughts to be my thoughts. And I invite you into into my crazy head. I invite you into my brain. And I I invite you to point out every single thought that I've had that exalts itself uh, doctrinally, biblically, theologically, or personally against the thoughts you have. If I think things about the Bible that aren't your thoughts, and I pray that you would replace them with your thoughts instead. If I think things about people in this room and beyond that aren't things that you think about them, I pray that you would replace me with your thoughts for them instead. If I hate where you love, I get rid of the hate and I grab the love. If I disrespect where you respect, I get rid of the disrespect and I grab the respect instead. If I've been living according to my gut, Rather than the wisdom from on high, I ask you to crucify my gut and to give me your wisdom and your word instead. 
Lord, I, I don't want one thing in me. I don't want one thing in each member of this body. And I don't want one thing in the community of your saints here to exalt itself above you. Come, Lord, turn on the lights all over this church. Expose every foul thing. Don't condemn us. Don't embarrass us. Just save us. We repent today, dear God. We surrender our lives to you. Prepare our heart to receive what comes next. Allow not one jaded or cynical thing to interfere with what comes next. We're going to sing in this last song that we surrender all to you, dear God. I pray that the lyrics of the song would not just be something we sing today. I pray that that would absolutely be our heart's cry. I pray that it would be our prayer. And that specifically today as we surrender all, dear God, what we're mostly saying is I surrender every single thought and inclination, every foul thing in me to you. Not simply to go away, but to re be replaced with your love and your presence and your truth instead. Thank you for lovingly correcting us today. Thank you for lovingly administering and ministering your word into our heart. It's in your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We are always so encouraged to hear when God is working in your life. If the messages of Monterey Church have touched you in some way, please share that with us by sending an email to info at montereychurch.net or by finding us on Facebook. Simply search Monterey Church in the search bar. And if you'd like to give to this ministry, you could do so by clicking the Give tab on our website to help us bring messages just like this one to you every single week.